the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, hello, and a very warm welcome to Peer Home with me, Sahan Hatu. Well, we all know that humans are beings that are social, we mingle with society naturally, and hence we have needs and wants, and of course we have expectations. Today we'll be discussing the psychology of expectations, of course we'll have other segments to our program, we'll have from here and there a report and much, much more, so you'll definitely want to stay with us. to the program while well, we did say that we were speaking about expectations we'll speak about the psychology of expectations the implement implications that is healthy unhealthy high expectations and so on and so forth but first let's go and listen to our story and we'll be back The Servant's Shoe. Once upon a time, there was a party in which some masters and their servants were invited. The masters talked to each other, and the servants listened quietly. Each master talked about the advantages of his own life. One of them said, the best thing in life is to have a good and hard-working servant. Another said, How is your servant? He is very clever, agile, and hard-working. During all the years that he has worked for me, he has never been lazy. Impossible. I myself have been lazy sometimes. How is it possible that the servant has never been lazy? The master patted on his servant's back and said, Go to the bazaar right now and buy some salt from the grocery store. The servant stood up and went out. The master said, Now you will see what he does. I will tell you where he is now and when he'll be back. He left the house right now. He is walking quickly. Now he has reached the square. He passes the square. Now he is at the bazaar. The bazaar is crowded. He goes from places where are less crowded. Now he is near the grocery store. He stands there for a while to get his breath. He says hello and asks for the salt. Now he is taking the salt and paying the price. Now he is coming back. He runs so that he will be back here sooner. Now be quiet and listen. You will hear him knock the door in a moment. Everybody kept quiet. A knock on the door was heard. Everybody said, Well done. The servant came in and sat next to his master. At this time, another master told his servant, You should be like this one too. I can, if you want me to do so. The next day, there was a party again. Everyone talked about his business and his life. Meanwhile, a master said, now that you are talking about the positive characteristics of your servants, I want to do it too. A person asked, What special abilities does he have? He is as quick as a wink. How? I'll send him to Bazaar right now to convey my regards to Shams, the cobbler. Let's see how quickly he'll be back. Then 
He looked at the servant and said, Tell Shams to cobble my shoes however he likes. The servant stood up and left the room. The master told the details of his journey just as the other master had said the day before. Then he said happily, Now you will see where my servant is now. He must be at the door right now. Where are you, servant? The servant, who was near the door, said, I am here, master. Did you deliver my message to the cobbler? The message? No, I haven't left the house yet. What are you saying? What have you been doing all this time? I was looking for my shoes, master. There are so many pairs of shoes here that I couldn't understand which one of them is mine. It is as if all the shoes of the world were here. The master, who was pale due to feeling ashamed, said, You stupid! Haven't you left the house yet? Are you still searching among the shoes? Welcome back to the program. Well, we're honored and delighted to have back with us here uh, Dr. Fatemi. Uh, hello and welcome to the program. Hello. Uh, Dr. Fatemi, is, uh, uh, he's done his postdoctoral studies in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University. He also teaches in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University and he teaches the University of Massachusetts in Boston and the Boston Graduate School of Psychoanalysis and Western Washington University. Dr. Fatimi is a registered psychologist and a keynote speaker at a number of international congresses, as well as a published author. He's also part of the advisory and editorial board of the American Psychological Association Encyclopedia of Critical Psychology. Uh, again, it's uh, wonderful to have you back with us, uh, Dr. Fatimi. Um, let's dive right into our discussion about the psychology of expectations and start off with what are the psychological implications of expectation for people who are in a relationship? Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, uh, let's just um, excavate the etymological layers of expectation when you expect somebody to do something or you've got an expectation in connection with somebody. Mm -hmm. What are the implications? Uh, the first implications of expecting somebody to do something is um, to presuppose that that person is going to say yes to you. When mm -hmm. you expect your husband, for example, to park the car for you, the presupposition is that you know he is going to be saying yes mm -hmm. explicitly to your assumptions that he's in charge. So when you expect somebody to do something, uh, it's a matter of expectation, but it's a matter of supposition. It's a matter of assumption too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these assumptions have got something wrong in themselves because mm -hmm. uh, the assumption itself needs to be deconstructed. Uh, lots of times in a relationship, you assume that. Um, your husband is going to do this, your wife is going to do this, um, she or he is going to take care of the following. Mm -hmm. When you go and uh, get all these uh, assumptions peeled off, you find out the assumption itself is null and void. Mm -hmm. And therefore the expectation is not going to work out. So when you have an expectation, you've got to make sure that deep down your expectation, mm -hmm. the assumption is fine too. And also the expectation... So if um, fine, you mean, is it fair? Is it fair to assume... Yeah, is it fair to assume or is it safe to assume? Uh, you may have the assumption that um, if you call, for example, your sister 2 o'clock um, right after midnight, mm -hmm. she's going to be responsive, she's going to be mm -hmm. uh, the recipient of your call, and she's going to be quite receptive. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, you just um, find out that she is describing your act as something that is perturbable, that is disturbing, and something that she cannot imagine in her uh, wild, mm -hmm. you know, imagination. So the expectation needs to be understood with mm -hmm. regard to the assumption. Lots of time we expect people to do things, but the assumption itself is um, barking up the wrong tree. Mm -hmm. So the expectation needs to be uh, associated with the assumption. And also the goal of relationship has got an impact on expectation. Mm -hmm. When people are, ex you know, are expecting to have some romantic relationship, the expectations are different in mm -hmm. comparison with the time when they have a serious uh, nuptial relationship. Mm -hmm. The expectation in a romantic relationship is um, moderate, is low. You know, you expect somebody to do something but not to the extreme. 
But when you are in a serious uh, engagement, involved in a relationship or something, mm -hmm. you expect the person to take care <coughs> of um, mm -hmm. everything, to split the hair, read mm -hmm. between the lines, and that expectation somehow is, as is associated with the context of relationship. Mm -hmm. Of course, because if you're, um, I guess, just uh, dating, then it's just the frivolous stuff of buying you gifts and uh, pampering you, and then as opposed to real life marriage. Yeah, um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that the mode of relationship, the dynamics of relationship itself, has an impact on the expectation. The moment you call somebody a father, Mm -hmm. The moment you call somebody a mother, All right, because there's you know, more responsibilities. Yeah, and, and the with. moment you you just say, for example, this uh, this is a couple, mm -hmm. so the expectation is going to come out of that sort of uh, uh, assumption that these people are in such a relationship, mm -hmm. and therefore the mode of relationship has an impact on how you describe that relationship, you define that relationship, and the boundaries that are going to be examined within that relationship mm -hmm. too. Okay, of course, because the, of the commitments that they make, I guess, in a nuptial relationship, you've made a lot more commitment as opposed to someone who is not married. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so some people have high expectations uh, than other people. Uh, can we discuss the social context and examine its impact? Yeah, uh, the question is that when you have high expectations, what are the kind of things that you get along with these high expectations? Sometimes, um, you have, uh, you know, we can have four different approaches uh, mm -hmm. in regards to people. If we are mm -hmm. trusting and we trust people, the expectations are going to be created mm -hmm. uh, based on this trust. Sometimes you may have a dismissive approach. So you dismiss people, you put them down, you sell them short, you look condescending, you know, and because you, con you, you have this condescending attitude, you expect people to take care of a lot of things that uh, you are the center of uh, prescribing those expectations. Mm -hmm. When you have a feeling of inferiority, you may not expect a lot. You are expecting yourself to be dependent, you cling to people, and as a result of that sort of expectation, the expectation that you have is because of the nature of your relationship, you describe yourself as somehow over-dependent because mm -hmm. of that sense of inferiority. or. In some cases, you describe yourself and people around yourself both inferior and the expectations are going to be different too. Mm -hmm. So your expectations are going to come uh, from the attitude that you have uh, created for yourself and that attitude has got a lot to do with the philosophy of emotions that you have been brought up in your family. Mm -hmm. If you've got, for example, a philosophy of emotion that says, well, it is fine to expect people to do certain things mm -hmm. or sometimes you expect people to be, for example, your servant, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You expect people to take a leaf out of your book. You expect people to be uh, just saying yes no matter what your uh, but you know, demands are. But doesn't have to do with confidence, does it? It's more about, I guess, pride. It's not, it's not a matter of confidence. It's a matter of hubris. It's a matter of arrogance. It's a matter of an overbearing mm -hmm. attitude that you've mm -hmm. got. So once you've got this overbearing, overbearing attitude mm -hmm. along with arrogance and mm -hmm. egotism mm -hmm. and ego speaks kind of thing, mm -hmm. you expect people, like uh, studies have demonstrated that people who have got ego speaks, for example, mm -hmm. in a company, in an organization, mm -hmm. in a party or something, they expect people to listen to them mm -hmm. regardless of, for example, he's taking about half an hour of the conversation and everybody's silent, he's just going to be the only enchilada in the party or something right, because, because the expectation is that, well, i got to be the center of the attention. Mm -hmm. The expectation of people who come from a shy background is that, you know, I don't expect anybody to do anything because I feel, you know, sort of inferior. Okay. The expectation of a person who has got a good sense of self is that, well, I expect people uh, to do the same thing that I'm expecting mm -hmm. uh, they, them to do for me. So it's a matter of reciprocal expectation based on a good sense of self. Mm -hmm. This was the category of dismissed? Is that what you're no, the dismissive is that mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. come with this superiority mm -hmm. sort of attitude. You, you know, you've got your high horses mm -hmm. going on. Oh, there's that person and then the inferior yeah. person. And is the inferior else. person. The inferior person, you've got the condescending look. So the expectation that you've got is mm -hmm. different because you put them down, you sell them short, whereas in the dismissive part, you dismiss any possibility of connectedness to you. Mm -hmm. And the fourth one? Is there a fourth one? Or I thought you said there was four. Yeah, the fourth one is that you've got inferior 
uh, you, you consider yourself inferior and people around yourself inferior too. Okay. Because the second one is that you feel inferior, but uh, people around yourself, you describe them as sort of good. So you try to be over-dependent and through this clinging sort of relationship, you try to um, get some sense of um, decency because of that expectation that you've got in your mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we'll uh, obviously talk a little bit more about healthy expectations and unhealthy expectations, but we'll go for a break. And when we come back, it's time for From Here or There. So don't go away. Welcome back to the program. Now it's time for From Here and There with my colleague, Farhad Vafaju. In this part of the program, we have an email, an interesting uh, article for you, and of course, a book. So let's see what From Here and There is all about today. Thank you very much, Ms. Vafaju. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of From Here and There. An international team of researchers suggests that different disorders and problems in children may be caused by delayed fatherhood. The study indicates that delaying childbearing is associated with increased risk of psychiatric and academic problems in the offspring. Comparing children of a 45-year-old dad to those of a 24-year-old father in the research shows remarkable increased risk in wide range of problems. Increased rates of autism, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, suicide attempts, and substance abuse problems were all reported in the recent investigation. The researchers looked at 2.6 million people and a different difference between siblings born to the same father as it accounts for differences in upbringing between families. The research conducted by Indiana University in the United States and Sweden's Karolinska Institute has been regarded as the largest and one of the best designed studies on the issue. An earlier study also demonstrated that increased paternal age could lower the child's cognitive function in abilities such as memory, learning, and concentration. Scientists have suggested the 20s and early 30s as the ideal years for fatherhood. Welcome back. Today I'm going to introduce the book Self-Building, an Islamic Guide for a Spiritual Migration Towards God, written by Ayatollah Ibrahim Amini. The book presents a detailed description of special deeds as performed by God's most devoted sincere servants during their lives, the self-restraint and asceticism practiced by them during these worships and the spiritual purification achieved by them. And some information on the author of the book. Ayatollah Ibrahim Amini was born in 1925 in the city of Najafabad in the province of Isfahan. Having finished his primary studies in Najafabad, he joined the Religious Learning Center of Isfahan in 1942. Then he joined the most famous Religious Learning Center of Rome in 1947, where he learned jurisprudence and principles under the tutorship of most eminent religious scholars of that period. Now it's time for your emails. Today we have received an email from Nilufar. She has written to us, Hello people in Pure Home. Thanks for inviting knowledgeable experts in your program. Their answers to the questions are so informative most of the time. I have a question today. I want to know what we should expect from our partner? Well, that's a very general question, but Dr. Fatimi, would you please? Uh... Well, um, you need to define who your partner is and what kind of relationship you're in for your partner. If it's an emotional uh, sort of relationship, you expect people to take care of your emotions. Um, 
I can say that based on research and uh, findings in terms of a spousal relationship and couples relationship, one of the uh, biggest uh, and one of the most vital uh, sort of needs that people have got in terms of expectation goes back to the expectation of uh, receiving love and caring attitude. So that's the least that is going to be uh, not only inclusive, but also comprehensive in terms of uh, a healthy relationship. If you're in a relationship and you're not receiving that sort of attention, that sort of caring attitude, that sort of uh, love, attention, understanding, your relationship is going to be perturbed in the long run. So studies have demonstrated that, uh, according to John Gottman, who was doing a lot of studies in the University of Washington in Seattle, after 15 years, um, long studies and longitudinal studies too, with respect to couples and uh, spousal relationship, he found out 96% of uh, relationship in terms of healthy or unhealthy goes back to quality of relationship. So if the quality of relationship is fine, you're going to be fine. And the quality of relationship has got a lot to do with do you receive love in that relationship? Do you feel uh, listened to? Or do you feel discounted? If you feel discounted, that is not the sort of expectation that is going to have a positive impact on your life and your well, continuation. Well, Dr. Fadim, I think you agree with me that expectation is part of our nature. We expect everyone to some extent uh, some different things, but it becomes a disorder when it goes beyond some level. I mean, uh, demanding is uh, what I'm talking about right now. To what extent do you think expectation is normal from our significant others, of course? Well, yeah, if, if you want to analyze um, the nature of expectation in people's personality, uh, it goes back to what is it that has happened to them in the past. People who are, for example, brought up in families where they do not have that sense of security, where they do not have that sense of good sense of self, where they have uh, a lot of thirst and hunger for receiving, for example, attention or something, it goes without saying that their expectation is way different from people who were brought up in a family with uh, a good sense of self, a good understanding, a good form of support or something. So it all goes back to the emotional background, the emotional heritage, the type of relationship that they have experienced. It's got a lot to do with the phenomenology of people's life in terms of the expectation that they have been subscribed to or as a result of that subscription they are right now expected to have that sort of expectation. You're expected to have that sort of expectation in view of the background that, for example, you were brought up. Or she's expected to have this sort of expectation. Uh, for example, if people have not received that sense of caring attitude, that sense of warmth and affection and love, obviously they're going to be thirsty. They're going to be hungry for receiving a lot of attention. And depending on the situation, they may turn out to be seeking different avenues of uh, attention and this might unfold itself in a form of I expect you to take care of me, I expect you to pamper me, I expect you to you know be as uh, close to me as possible and all of them and once you get that analyzed you can see that it's got a lot to do with the underlying psychological factors that go to the past uh, form of life. If I can just just add, basically, I think on the other end of the spectrum, someone who possibly may have been given too much love and too much attention and spoiled uh, may also turn into that superior kind of attitude where they expect people and demand people to constantly give them attention and they have expectations because they've always been given too much attention and too much, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I mean, people who have, got, for example, have got, uh, who have received an over-pampering relationship they might expect people, for example, to just uh, be always available, be always accessible. So they turn out to be either gullible or have got high expectation because of that sort of relationship that they have. But it's an unrealistic formation of mm -hmm. expectation because of the dynamics of the underlying psychological factors that he or she has been exposed to. Right. And as my final question, I have uh, heard from many couples, they uh, usually complain that we have been living together for more than 10 years and uh, my husband or my wife should expect what I need without uh, clearly and obviously expressing their needs. How, what advice do you have for these couples? Well, uh, well, one of the things that again has got a destructive impact on that sort of things is the matter of assumptions. You know, assumptions, um, if they're not peeled up, if they're not deconstructed, they can be 
the biggest impediment in the way of your uh, consummation, in the way of your happy life or something. Because the assumptions always intervene in a negative manner. You assume that, for example, your wife, uh, you expect her, for example, to do the following. She's got no idea. She's got no clue that you would, for example, want her to just go ahead with the following expectation. So the best way is to make the assumptions clear, to peel off the assumptions, and discuss in a conversational analysis of what are my expectations because of what are the assumptions. And the best bet is to express yourself in a positive manner so that you can develop uh, positive expectations in, in connection with your positive assumptions. Probably to omit that phrase of, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you, right? <laughs> yeah, <Right>. exactly. <laughs> yes. You know, that's why they say it's an old proverb that uh, marriage is like uh, a phone call in the middle of the night or something. You receive it, but then you realize, what is it all about? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Nilufar, I hope you have found the answer uh, convincing enough. We try to answer your question from different angles, but from next on, please try to specify your question, narrow it more down so we can answer your question more easily. Thanks for watching. Back to Ms. Akju. Thank you very much, Mr. Vapaju. And now it's time for our report, but don't go away. We have more about the psychology of expectations. <laughs> It is a Mu'arraq exhibition. I'd like to tell you the history of Mu'arraq. Mu'arraq art dates back to the time when wooden comb was found in Shahr Sukhde, burnt city in Iran. There were some remains of Mu'arraq on the comb, so we can say that Mu'arraq art has originated from Shahr Sukhde in Iran. In the past, it was thought that Mu'arraq originated from such countries as China and India, and then it entered Iran. But based on the discovery of this comb, we can say that Mu'arraq have originated from Iran. The most famous Mu'arraq artist whose name reminds us of this art is Master Ramami. His style is arabesque, flowers and birds and others. After him, Master Inalu, who has been famous for 10 years, introduced a new style to Mu'arraq art, which is called the style of separating colors. If you look at the works carefully, you can see some works of arabesque and flowers and birds. This is the traditional style. The other works have the style of separating colors. We can turn a photo, a portrait, or anything else into Mu'arraq. I'm an apprentice of Master Inanlu. I prefer to elaborate more on this style. The difference of this style with other styles is that we divide the work based on the colors and contrast of the pattern, so the range of the woods used in this style is greater. Woods that are usually used in Mu'arraq works include walnut wood, which ranges from ripe walnut to light color walnut. The next common wood is jujube, which ranges from light colors such as russet and orange to dark colors such as crimson. The other common woods are gray woods such as the wood of orange tree, the woods of sour orange, fig, and maple. Maple is mainly used to show sky, but due to the abundance of lines in it, it is suitable for showing ground too. If I want to elaborate on the general process of our work, I have to say that we first choose the background wood. Depending on the size of the pattern, the size of the background wood is a 70 by 60 or 70 by 40 centimeters or any other suitable size. Then we stick the pattern on a piece of plywood and cut it into pieces with a bow saw which is the main tool in our work. 
Then each piece of the pattern is placed on the wood with a suitable color, and we cut the colored wood exactly as the plywood. For example, in an intricate pattern, we pick up each piece of plywood from the background, cut the colored wood based on it, and replace the plywood with the colored wood on the background. <laughs> Welcome back to the program. Uh, well, if you've just tuned in, we're here with Dr. Fatima and we're speaking about the psychology of expectation. And uh, we're, we've reached a point where we want to analyze healthy and unhealthy expectations. Uh, well, deep down, unhealthy forms of expectation, it's a matter of um, selfishness. It's a matter of egoism. It's a matter of egotism. It's a matter of everybody should be are doing what I expect them to do. Mm -hmm. So you consider yourself in the center of the world and because of that sort of arrogance or overbearing attitude, your expectations are going to be increasingly high. Every moment you expect people to take care of the whole things. And uh, also, it is associated with um, a discounting look, a downgrading attitude towards people around yourself mm -hmm. because uh, from a humanistic perspective or an Islamic perspective, which is going to be making more sense, mm -hmm. um, you need to expect people to be at least um, reciprocal in terms of what you expect yourself to do for them. If you're not, for example, um, giving, for example, that sort of support, or if you're not serving as a source of support, for people around yourself, how, how would you, you expect, expect people? Or how like would you expect? Like a give and take yeah. kind of it's, relationship. It, the, the minimum possibility is the give and take. Uh, whereas in a mystical understanding of expectation, you somehow overcome all these senses of um, egoism and you get them molded into an understanding of you expect people nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a sort of, I mean, there are two different things that we need to make a distinction. Sometimes you do not expect people to do anything because you're sort of depressed, for example, you're mm -hmm. lonely, you're in a dismal world, mm -hmm. and sometimes you achieve that sort of maturity, intellectual, emotional, spiritual mm -hmm. development of that maturity, that you, re you really do not expect people anything mm -hmm. because um, you see yourself somehow enriched, enhanced, and empowered. Mm -hmm. So if they do not do uh, what they usually are, they're usually they're expected to do, you do not get sort of disturbed or something. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to, again, your mentality, your attitude of how you, you know, see yourself and how you see people. People, there are, some psychologists have got this term, and it's worth mentioning it, that our relationship towards people can be classified in the following way. It's the I-it relationship. Mm -hmm. An I-it relationship is that I consider myself as the center of the world and people are considered as objects. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I can expect them to do anything I want. It's also a matter of it-you uh, it, relationship, mm -hmm. that I do not consider myself anything. It's just a, like you know, a fifth wheel kind of thing, chopped liver mm -hmm. sort of thing. And people yeah, are... Constantly you know, at people's Constantly, service. yeah. You just need to be people pleaser. You're too concerned about other people's feelings and emotions and all of them. And therefore, you're just seeking these avenues of confirmation. There is also a matter of it, it, mm -hmm. where you just consider yourself as an object and people are in yourself. So there is no respect, there is no understanding. That's probably that kind of depre depressed person, right? Um, just... Yeah, it's a kind of depressed or it's a kind of antagonistic uh, sort of um, attitude associated with bellicosity and hostility or something because of some pathological aspects of relationship. Or it's a matter of I-you relationship, which is uh, you know, which is a matter of, healthy. you know, you, yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a healthy relationship. It's a healthy expectation. You expect people, but in the midst of 
your interaction based on some healthy parameters. Mm. And now going back to that egocentric person, <clears throat> the one, the I, it person, um, would it be fair to say that that person is also setting themselves up to be constantly disappointed because you're, you might not constantly be getting the attention that you're uh, seeking and the expectations that you have of people may not always, you know, you, you're assuming and you have that assumption, like you said, but they may not give you what you expect. Uh, so are you somehow setting yourself to constantly be disappointed or upset? Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is a good way to describe it. And uh, it's an interesting sort of observation. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to what you're saying, which is so good, uh, you can also add that deep down you got this anger mm -hmm. because you expect people, for example, to do the following. They're not going to do it because mm -hmm. they do not consider themselves enslaved by you. Right. And therefore, they're not going to necessarily, um, you know, meet what you're expecting mm -hmm. them to do. And as a result of that, you just fly off the handle. You know, because this anger, you know, this, you become furious because, uh, this fear is because of, uh, because of high expectation, because of the fact that you describe people in your attitude, people are just enslaved by your demands. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, you end up being demanding and controlling and obviously they're not going to go with it. Mm -hmm. And when they do not go with it, you just uh, consider yourself as somehow deceived or, mm -hmm. you know, bamboozled or somehow you've been had or something. These are the some of the terms mm -hmm. that you describe because you expect people to immediately do uh, what you want them to do. There is this sense of immediacy deep down your expectation that they just need to be available always. Mm -hmm. But who is it that is going to be available if you are not in practice implementing mutually agreed upon avenues of availability based on some emotional intimacy? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, okay, well, we'll take a quick break and we'll be back. Welcome back to the program. Well, uh, we're uh, basically finishing off our discussion about uh, the expectations. And so, so what are some of the underlying elements of an expectation? Well, um, deep down the underlying elements of expectations, uh, there are a number of things, including the following. One is that how would you describe yourself? How would you analyze? How would you define yourself? Do you mm -hmm. see yourself at the top of the world? Do you see yourself as somebody who's going to be immersed in a sort of narcissistic behavior? Mm -hmm. Or do you see yourself as modest? Do you see yourself as shy? Do you see yourself um, exposed to different fears of rejection or something? All of them have got an impact on your expectation. Mm -hmm. Plus, how do you see people around yourself? So it's an attitude about the others, you know, and how you describe them in terms of your philosophy, in terms of are they going to be considered as um, people who are going to move in line with what you're telling them, or they're just going to be human beings uh, with their own expectations. Are they going to be entitled to, do ha to have the following or they're not going to be entitled? Uh, so uh, one of the other aspects of the underlying elements of expectation is that uh, how much would you consider yourself entitled? Mm -hmm. uh, where is this entitlement coming from? Uh, I mean, I, I know that this is not, uh, uh, I guess, characteristically speaking, it wouldn't be correct to say that people who m demand more, people who expect more, is it fair to say that they get more in life as opposed to someone who is more considerate of other people's feelings and says, hey, you know what, you know, I shouldn't expect too much of everyone else? People who tend to expect more seem to get more. Is that yeah, fair this, to say? this is a subtle point. I think we have to make a distinction between expecting people or expecting things in terms of you've got positive plan and positive visualization which are in an Islamic doctrine recommended. Mm -hmm. You know Imam Raza alayhi salam says that the greatness of uh, one's personality lies in the magnitude of expectation. It means if mm -hmm. you expect for example to just get uh, a book a day mm -hmm. you're gonna get a book. If you expect to get 10 books you're going to go with 10 books. 
So, and Imam Hussein alayhi salam has, gonna, has got another hadith saying that uh, God likes people who have got great expectation. Mm -hmm. In the sense that you just pointed out, when you are expecting, that expectation is different from this sort of expectation. Right, you're, because you're that expectation it, it's is not demanding from yeah, people. Yeah, it's not a matter of controlling or life. demanding. It's not, you know, when you're controlling or demanding, you're going to different. end up bothering people. Mm -hmm. because um, you're, you're violating their boundaries. Mm -hmm. But when you have high expectation in terms of high aspirations, mm -hmm. you would just mobilize all your forces. And therefore, when you expect people in that sense, you try to get them involved in that sense of positive cycle of mobilization. So there are two different things. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, you're right. When you expect you know, to receive more, you're going to go. If you just expect yourself to be in the first... Um, Freshmore class or something, you're going to end up being a freshmore. If you go, for example, expect yourself to get your MA, mm -hmm. you're going to go with MA. If you expect yourself to go, for example, for a PhD or more, you're going to be. So if, if your expectation is to just stay where you are mm -hmm. at, you know, in your organizational hierarchy, if you're just, you know, whatever you are, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of a status. But I'm actually talking about the person who is egocentric and who is, uh, like I'm saying, I mean, Islamically speaking and socially speaking, that person, I mean, it's not uh, the right attitude to have, but they do. They they expect more of people and they're more demanding and people tend to give them more. They tend Well, it depends to give on the type more. of people that they they're come across. By, yeah. If there are people who are passive, yes, you're right. But if there are people who are assertive and expect, you know, expressive, they're going to look into their eyes mm -hmm. and assertively and expressively say that, well, you expect the following and that's going to be fine, but do you realize that I also have the following expectation from you? Mm -hmm. So you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It's not a matter of uh, allowing people to take advantage of you. Mm -hmm. Because when people come from that sense of expectation, their best victim is people are people who are coming from that passive background. Right. You know, if you just try to be demanding, controlling, your best uh, bet would be people who are just in dire need of your confirmation. Mm -hmm. They could just get the attention because uh, you're so demanding, you're so controlling, and once you come across and bump into these types of people, they're the best uh, sort of uh, bet for you because they can just provide you with that sort of thing yeah, like through their listening. Your you know, you know, <laughs> so, yeah, and it's a matter of being submissive or something. So being submissive is going to be uh, corroborating, substantiating, and confirming that egotistic attitude because of the, t the type of expectation that they have created. But once you're expressive and assertive, and you can just look into their eyes and say, well, you know, wake up and smell the coffee. Yeah. You've got your expectations, I've got mine. We can just be on the same page as long as we have this entitlement reconsidered and revamped. So you don't allow, you, you know, people are, you know, around yourself to take advantage of you. Yeah. Uh, but you're right, if they just come across those people who are easily um, allowing people to take advantage of them, yes, that is going to confirm and testify that you can go uh, through. And, and one of the ways that, and one of the reasons that they have continued to be demanding in that sort of... Because people have let them get exactly. away Exactly. Right? I mean, it's just a matter of, of people in that sort of caliber, that sort of a status, they always confirm. So you need to just do what is called the role of the unexpected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, put them into an unexpected position and that is going to somehow tell them that the reality is not what yeah. it used to be. A bit of a reality check, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> put them in the place. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fatimi, for being with us. Unless, uh, I mean, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, we'd like to continue speaking forever, but uh, that's not possible. Thanks again for being with thank us. You. And to all of our viewers, thanks for being with us and uh, tuning in. Don't forget, you can go on our website, sarahtv.ir, and uh, drop us a line and uh, tell us what you think. Your comments, your questions, and uh, your opinions are very important to us. Purehome at sarahtv.ir is our email. Thanks so much for inviting us into your pure home. Until next time, goodbye and God bless.